been searching all over the world for you. You are going to be a force for good and a very important sorcerer. But for now, you're my apprentice. I'm a what? Are you insane? The blade of fate hangs above Fenris. Together we shall drive it deep into the icy earth of that worthless world. These miserable echoes of Lehman Rust will face a legion renewed with arcane might. Conclaves of sorcerers will shatter the Fang's battlements. Unending hordes of ashen dead Rubrikai will harvest every soul within its fallen walls. At Morane, Gost Wenthin Verbis Nex, Ind Obrium Bis Pendrue, Paran Sicortis Rex! It doesn't matter if you're a first-time spellslinger or a seasoned master of the mystic arts. A new edition of Pathfinder means changes to the existing casting system. So I think we're all in for a refresher. One of the first big changes to the casting system in Pathfinder 2nd Edition is there are new magical traditions. Think of a magical tradition as a source or a type of magical ability. This is generally the source or where your powers come from. Back from the original Pathfinder is, of course, Arcane. In the Arcane, power comes from logic, knowledge, and reason. It's all about what you know, and it has sort of a learned, practiced quality to it. Examples of Arcane casters would be guys like Gandalf from The Lord of the Rings, Doctor Strange from Marvel, Zatanna from DC, and Ahriman from Warhammer 40k. Also back from Pathfinder 1 is the Divine. The power in Divine Magic comes from belief, faith, conviction, and devotion. It's up to the individual player, DM, and world whether or not the power of Divine Casters actually comes from your god, goddess, or whatever it is you worship. That part is deliberately very open to interpretation. Some examples of Divine Casters would be the Sisters of Battle from Warhammer 40k, who get their power from their belief in the Emperor. Also, the Word Bearers from Warhammer 40k, whose power comes pretty directly from the Four Chaos Gods. The Guardians in Destiny, who get their power from the Traveler, and the Jedi, whose power comes from the Force. Now on to the new magical traditions in Pathfinder 2. First up, Occult. This is where your power comes from knowledge, but of obscure and hidden things. The occult has sort of a superstitious or spooky, weird quality to it. Characters I would think of as occult tradition would be guys like Harry Dresden from the Dresden Files, Constantine, the Eldar Farseers in Warhammer 40k, and Raven from Teen Titans. Finally, we have the primal tradition. This is where power comes from your connection to nature or other forces. Examples of primal casters would be like the Avatar in the Avatar series. Well, any of the benders, really. The Four Maidens from Rooster Teeth's Ruby series also feel kind of primal with their elemental themes that they have. Swamp Thing in DC with his connection to the green. And finally, Galadriel and a lot of the elves in Lord of the Rings draw their power from the natural world, in a way. Now let's look at the actual schools of magic in Pathfinder 2. Most of these are relatively unchanged, but there were a couple of really small alterations. First up, Abjuration. This type of magic is all about protection and defense. Then there's Conjuration. Conjuration is basically about movement and transport. This can be moving yourself from place to place in the form of, like, teleportation, or calling creatures from another plane of existence to you with things like summoning. Divination is all about things like prediction and gathering information either about the past, present, or future. Enchantment is likewise pretty straightforward. It's all about manipulating the minds of those around you. Enchantment has always been sort of a tricky school. It can be extremely powerful if done well, but with most enchantment abilities, it's also possible to completely fail. With Pathfinder 2's spectrum of success, ranging from critical success to critical failure, 
enchantment has a little more usability, but I also think they may have taken out some of the best stuff like Hold Person. Next, we have a very popular school, Evocation. These are your damage dealing spells. Fireballs, lightning bolts, the wrath of nature well in hand. Then there's Illusion. Like Enchantment, Illusion affects the minds of others, but in a less direct way. Here you create figments and patterns to beguile your enemies, and glamours to deceive them. They've also taken a lot of the shadow spells from Illusion and put them into different schools. In Pathfinder 1, Shadow was a school of illusion, and it was an interesting one because shadows were treated as quasi-real projections made of matter from the plane of shadow. One of the schools that's changed the most is Necromancy. In Pathfinder 2, Necromancy is the manipulation of life and death for fun and profit. But in all seriousness, the cure and heal spells are now in Necromancy. I disagree with this because I disagree with the definition they're using for necromancy. I think that it should be the manipulation of the bodies and souls of the dead. But that's my opinion, not Paiso's. So in Pathfinder 2, your friendly healing cleric is a dread necromancer. Boah. Finally, there's the always useful transmutation. This involves the transforming or altering of objects and beings in a variety of ways. I have one minor gripe with Transmutation, and that's the spell Disintegrate. It used to be one of the most powerful spells in Transmutation. Basically, you're turning your target into dust. They went and put that in Evocation for reasons that I can't fathom. Now that we're done with the big overview of the concepts in the new casting system, let's dig into specifics with Prepared versus Spontaneous Casting. Just like the original Pathfinder, wizards and clerics are prepared casters, whereas bards and sorcerers are spontaneous. If you are a prepared caster, you must specifically pick your spells at the start of the day and use up a spell slot to prepare a spell. As an example, if you want to cast Fireball twice in a day, you will need to prepare Fireball two times with two spell slots. Prepared spellcasters are great for utility, because they can know a wide number of spells and prepare what's needed for the day. But they have the drawback of being caught out of ammunition at inconvenient moments. Next, spontaneous casters. You know a small number of spells called your spell repertoire, but you can cast as many or as few spells from your repertoire as you like. To go back to the Fireball example, you can cast Fireball for as many times as you have spell slots for it. Spontaneous casters are good for dedicated roles in a party, as an example DPS or Healer. Now we need to talk about an important concept to understand in Pathfinder 2nd Edition, Heightening Spells. If you are a prepared caster, heightening a spell is easy. You just prepare that spell in a higher level spell slot. For spontaneous casters, you have to know a spell at a higher level in order to heighten it. Let's say you're a sorcerer and you want to cast Fireball as a 5th level spell. You would need to know 5th level Fireball in your spell repertoire. Now for the big question. What do you get out of heightening your spell? Well, heightening a spell will give you an additional, more powerful effect, as listed in the spell's entry in the core rulebook. For damage dealing spells, this is usually something like additional damage dice. For control spells, they'll either give you better effects or more targets. It really varies from spell to spell. It's also important to look at this entry, because it will show you what level you can heighten your spell to. Some spells can be heightened every spell level, but not all. Some have to be heightened to specific levels to get additional effects. Next, let's talk about actually casting a spell. Casting a spell requires spell components, and each spell has a number of spell components. These are things that you must do in order to cast the spell. In most cases, a spell component will require an action. Exceptions to this rule include spells that are cast as a free action or a reaction. The spell components are verbal, somatic, material, and focus. 
A spell with a verbal and somatic component will take you two actions. A spell with only a verbal component will require one action. A spell with a verbal, somatic, and material component will require you three actions. Verbal components require you to speak in a strong voice. This makes it hard to conceal your spell casting. Spells with verbal components have the concentrate trait. This means you have to be able to focus on what you're doing. This is why you can't cast spells when you're in rage, or confused, or have some other mental impairment. Next, let's look at somatic. This involves making gestures and signs. Spells with somatic components gain the manipulate trait. You must have a stable limb to perform this action. Spells like Dragon Form and Elemental Form give you hands with which to perform somatic components afterward, but Animal Form does not. Finally, you can perform somatic components with an object in hand. The next spell component is Material. This is where a bit of physical material is consumed in the casting of the spell. This material is consumed even if the spell fails. You must have a free hand with which to retrieve the material. Spells with material components have the manipulate trait. Finally, focus. A focus is an item that channels the power of the spell but is not consumed in the casting. You must have a free hand to retrieve and use the focus. Spells with the focus component have the manipulate trait. Also, foci are typically expensive and must be acquired before the casting of the spell. Now that you know the actual components of a spell, let's get into the different types of spells. These are very broad categories. First off, there are regular spells. Most spells are going to fall into this category. You prepare them in or with your spell slots, and you get them back when you prepare for the day. Next, we have cantrips. These are zero-level spells that can be cast over and over again. A cantrip is always heightened to half your level, rounded up. The next type of spell is a focus spell. These spells are granted by class features, and they require a special resource called focus for you to cast them. A focus spell will cost you one point of focus. The first time you gain a focus spell, you also gain a pool of focus with one focus point. Your focus pool can never exceed three focus points. I know this sounds limiting, but you can get back one focus point by performing the refocus action. This takes you 10 minutes, wherein you do things like read your spellbook, meditate, pray, or whatever your caster does to get in touch with their magical tradition. Because this only takes 10 minutes, you'll usually have time either after a battle or when some non-life-threatening action is taking place wherein to refocus yourself and get that point back. The final type of spell is the most exciting, rituals. Rituals are complex spells that anyone, even non-casters, can perform. In order to perform a ritual, you must know the ritual. These are not learned through leveling and you have to go out into the game world and actually find someone who's either willing to perform it for you or teach it to you. In order to be the primary caster, the ritual's spell level can be no higher than half your level rounded up. Rituals have costly material components and there is an expense when performing them. The exact expense will be in the ritual's entry in the core rulebook. Many rituals require secondary casters, meaning this is an activity you can't perform by yourself. Unlike the primary caster, the secondary caster does not need a minimum caster level or proficiency. The next thing you need to understand about rituals are the checks involved. Every ritual has a primary skill check and a proficiency requirement. As an example, in order to perform a ritual, you might need to be an expert in occultism. You must be able to perform this skill check in order to begin the ritual, and you will have to make it at the height of the ritual. In rituals, there are also secondary checks. A secondary check must be made by a secondary caster. If there are multiple secondary checks, an additional secondary caster must be involved for each check. 
As an example, if there's a ritual that requires one primary and two secondary casters, and there is the primary skill check and two secondary skill checks, each one of the secondary casters would have to perform one of the secondary skill checks. Thank you for watching this guide about Pathfinder 2nd Edition from D6 Damage. Now, if you're interested in more class analysis and strategy guides for Pathfinder, both 1st and 2nd Edition, check us out right here on YouTube. And if you're interested in taking your game further, check out the D6 Damage Discord, where we have discussion groups for things like character builds, world building, and all kinds of things related to the game. The link is down in the description.